to share encounters and reflections collected during five years of research. Our mission is to show how art mix with economy and management in an ongoing process. Let us look at the flows between worlds of contemporary art and the managerial worlds of work, consumption, investment and the media. Let us meet some old and new masters of business art. Today art is a global visual industry with multitudes of mega venues. Here the audience at the opening of the 2003 Venice Biennale. But we'll start in Berlin Alexanderplatz 2001. Before 1989 a concrete Berlin wall supported abstract ideologies of an inside and an outside. After 1989 the wall no more fences off economic market from social organization and here in Berlin market and organization, business and politics began mixing with art deep inside the new model. Those in doubt of the power of art must go to Berlin where round every corner you find traces of totalitarian art like the Volksbühne Theater, once a playhouse for Nazis and communists and next door the Babylon Movie Palace, home of Murnau, Lang and Riefenstahl. Art is political power, Wagner in Germany or Wagner in Vietnam. Der Filmpreis 1937-38 wurde Frau Leni Riefenstahl für ihr Filmwerk Olympia, Fest der Völker, Fest der Schönheit zuerkannt. Ich möchte gern, dass der Film von einem Künstler gemacht wird und nicht von einem Parteifilmregisseur. This is not just a documentary about Vietnam. Vietnam. This is a main show, in the sense that uh, wherever America goes, they make a, a big show. Or mighty managerial tool, motivating crazy project as in Werner Herzog's movie Fitzcarraldo. Berlin, 2005. The Kunstfabrik. Product vision show. Artists present portraits of one single firm, publishing house Cornelson. Berlin, 2001, fields of flow show, artworks consultant. Gather managers and artists to reflect on economy. Business connected art, pink painted machinery from traditional industry, put on show at Haus am Platz at the invitation of director Karin Pott, accompanied by seminars with keynote by Italian master of business art Michelangelo Pistoletto. At a certain moment, the, the wall of Berlin fell down and, and the, the, the communist system disappeared. Uh, but the communist system disappeared, but the problem is still there. And now, after 12 years, the tower of New York, poof! Now is the capitalistic drama. Biela. 2002, Michelangelo's home base. Here English outsourced to Italian factories last century, now decline when Italian outsourced to Asia. Only luxury brands like Zenia or Ceruti remain next door to Città dell'Arte, where Michelangelo found a place for his center. You have to create a place where the product can become visible become the realization, become the building, become the thing. So I, I making the, this Chita uh, dell'arte, um, I transform the no place of Europe in a place. And Worrell had a pop art factory, Pistoletto started Progetto Arte. Here he welcomes young artists in residence. 
linked by global IT to the outside world. Backstage, Michelangelo's mirror art stored up as batteries of aesthetic energy fueling the front stage art on show. Like local diversification of Italian regions, art about management and art by Armin Szczuzinski about the void and work by Barnavaron, Galli, Cadet and Ferro. Textile, socio-economic symbolism in an installation by Hendrik Schrott using Xenia products. And sustainable energy balance of suit production by Leopold Kessler. It's all tuned in to Master Pistoletto's Our Povera icons, like this one on show at the 1997 documenta in Kassel, Germany. Modern art really attracts and fascinates the audiences. It has a magnetic force, making Marie Louise von Plessen talk about a sort of contemporary modern pilgrimage mm. to some a kind of dialogue that could be uh, achieved and, and fulfilled by looking at, at a, a, a painting in some church and um, engaging a silent dialogue with some saint. And museums take the role of uh, churches and religion. And maybe this is a sort of spiritual retreat for hard-working business people, well aware that the director of the Guggenheim has a business degree and that many art spaces are run by business school dropouts. Some eight years ago, a business student of mine, Peter, made this self-portrait of himself as a free student with graffiti as hobby and this scary prediction of himself as a bureaucratized businessman. Is this what MBAs must become? <laughs> In 2001 in Berlin, we gathered people, management students active in the arts, for instance, interested in turning masters of business administration into masters of business art. One of the participants was Armin Szczuzinski, an artist with experience from business. It's so nice to be in business. It's so really nice because you, you enter your office Someone waits for you and says, well, no calls to, uh, in the morning. Good morning, how are you? Fine, thank you. So when you're, when you're out working as an artist, most of the time you are in, uh, uh, in your studio. You work on your but own. artists in business cannot be alone anymore. There are no divas, and Picasso was right when he said, it's over. <laughs> Master Michelangelo runs like a family business and Maria Pioppi Pistoletto on managing a constantly creative entrepreneur. Daniel Birnbaum, philosopher, critic, rector of the Städelschule in Frankfurt, portrays a successful artist as an efficient manager. One morning when I was in Chicago and then I was supposed to make a small text for him and I met him in the business class lounge with other executives on the top floor of the Swiss Hotel and myself, I myself was saying some sort of strange tension and, and he was already, and he was answering his 111 emails from this and he is operating on that, my top manager. And, and he's also Forget about the artist craftsman. Robert Whitman on new ways of connecting to technique. The curators and people like that have gotten over the idea that every little thread or every little sweat 
part <laughs> of the original of the original piece of the artist is not valuable. That's not where the essence of the image or the work lies, but it's in what you see, and and the means of that is irrelevant. If the image is made, is consistent and the image is the same, it doesn't matter how you make it. Mm. Uh, you know, they've begun to accept that idea that what they're buying is the image, mm. not the machine or the technique or anything else. Mm. Thirty so years ago, Joseph Beuys, a German artist in a felt hat, advocated flows between art and business. He said that art was social sculpture, like serving your family a good meal. Maria serves pasta in Biela, and Michelangelo explains a concept central to business art. Then the term game, because mm -hmm. it is a game. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. the, the, the game is important to consider because uh, in the game it doesn't matter if you win or you lose. There is always the winner and loser, but it's part of the game. Mm -hmm. It's not really something terrible <laughs> or mm -hmm. something fun. Joseph Boyce in the Feltat would have preferred play to the word game. He explained that art is capital and that everyone is an artist and that qualified him as a real master of business art. He says enlarging the concept of art serves all humans and is useful for changing all societal conditions in urgent need of transformation. Boys inspired the Green Party in Germany, art a socio-economic force that was an idea from German aesthetic philosophy of Friedrich Schiller and Immanuel Kant. Following Friedrich Schiller, Joseph Beuys saw art as facilitating the playful, liberating movement in German Schwung. And in that spirit, a team of young artists went from Schittadelarte to rescue an old factory. Old industry was rooted in physical matter and formal administration. Like the formal International Labour Office bureaucracy protecting physical work now present only as a bronze sculpture at the Geneva headquarters. Inside this factory, the informal and immaterial economy threatening this hat maker seems very far away. What could be more material? than compressing rabbit hair into an ur-felt lump of matter Joseph Beuys and his inspirer Rudolf Steiner would have loved. And what could be more formal than forcing and formatting this raw matter into ways of existence and being almost metaphorical for how our behavior is frozen by standards of doing and thinking. Is this what managing should be about? Has the industrial tradition made managers focus solely on better ways of bending and twisting matter into form? until we conceived of only two perspectives, either form or matter. This is precisely where we need artists, because they work in the midfield between form and matter. They innovate poetically by playing with form and matter. The question is if the manager is sensitive enough to perceive this gentle play, can he spot the Mona Lisa smile of an artist ready for Schwung? Or is he blocked in the industrial paradigm? Professor Robert Austin of Harvard Business School describes. I am most aware of when I talk to executives or, or MBAs about this stuff is that they very much would prefer a world where what they understand about management transfers seamlessly to the new world, you know, the, the, the knowledge economy or whatever hokey phrase you'd like to use for that and they're disappointed 
and resistant to the idea that it doesn't. And suggesting that you need to learn something about the process of how artists do their work is telling them, in essence, that what you are expert in is not good enough. You need to learn something else. So, do we need Masters of Business Administration or Masters of Business Art? Do we need Harvard Business School or Pistolesos Citadel Arte? Back in Biela, we didn't write a case about hat making. We made an installation on matter, stoff, form and schwung play. Artwork as a model for management. Today you can't be sure these guys don't talk about art and travel to the Biennale and Documenta in their spare time. Or read flash art. Read about artists curated by Dirk Lukov from Siemens AG. Or know of the Daimler Chrysler art collection curated by Renate Wiehager, grand lady of corporate curating Marjorie Jacobson explains. Patronizing the visual arts in order to further that kind of activity in your community or your society. And I think that if you want to do that, that you have to have, you as a company or you as the director of the company has to have a particular feeling, not maybe not knowledge, but a feeling about uh, the art that you're collecting. Management consultants indulge in art terminology. Just listen to Mike Mayray. What would the world miss if your company disappears? Ask Christian Votava. The first stage was value for money. The second stage was uh, value for time. All the service uh, ideas. And I think the third stage is value for sense. And, and Michael Davids defines two, two distinguishing features. One is whether, whether you meet the artist or not, whether it's just a role model or you actually interact with the artist. If it's only a role model, we use two terms. One is metaphors like jamming or orchestrating chains and all these metaphors we have from the arts. And another one is competences, which is, well, how do we actually learn how to improvise? Can we learn something from looking at a jazz band uh, about improvising? Um, and another one is when you actually meet the, the, the artists, um, which we call events or products. Events is just like when a theatre company comes into a, a, a business corporation and work with them for a day and then they leave. That's the kind of thing. And there are many different kinds of events. When they actually start producing something together, more in a partnership, we call it products or processes. At the Venice Biennale 2003, I stumbled on a model of monetary flows by a guy called Phillips. Yeah, the man with the curve. This is artwork. Or is it an economic model? Anyway, it was produced by Compaq. So. Then I recalled The Quadrat, a video piece by Samuel Beckett I caught a glimpse of it in Castle. So was this a model of aesthetic play, with spectators, artists, consultants gravitating around art? Not to forget about the technicians. Artist Spencer Finch, however, mainly works with light. You're going to Troy, huh? Yes. And why are you going to Troy? <laughs> tomorrow, after tomorrow. On <laughs> <Not> Thursday. <laughs> That's good. And uh, in order to check out the, what was the it? Light, the exact lighting light situation on uh, at dawn in Troy. Why? Because I'm curious to recreate it then in a gallery context mm -hmm. using artificial light mm -hmm. with the, with people from from Philips or how, yes. how did how did that sort of yes. so Philips is providing the expertise and the lights and the actual equipment is coming from a lighting company in Hartford called CLS which is owned by this big collector who has bought my work before so Compaq did the Philips model and Philips helped Spencer Finch. Paolo Naldini, 
Uh, most of them also very short-term market implication, which makes it very difficult for us to, to intervene because we are not uh, an advertisement can, uh, agency whose, uh, whose uh, input impact can be recorded and measured after maybe some months. Uh, more, uh, some of them are already more uh, say enlightened in a way. Uh, are, are shifting the, their focus from the very short term to the long term. Uh, therefore, we are not dealing only with an portfolio. We are not dealing with an entrepreneurship uh, that is uh, enlightened and is able to understand how from art and, art and intellectuals and artistic enterprises you, you, you can get uh, uh, very deep and strong stimuli for your, for your production, for your Art is not made to meet a market um, the way I describe, you know, the really good okay. visual art. It's, it creates a market by, the, by being made. It is not created for a market that's over there. Fields of Flow invited philosopher Gernot Böhmer to France 2002, where he explained how he looked upon atmospheres in art spaces as the outcome of art. Actually, atmosphere is something between us, or our, our soul, or our, our mind, and the objects outside. There's something in between. And so it's difficult to, to talk about. Atmosphere is not about a word, not about language. Just listen to it. If you prefer dwell in it, like in the documenta, echoing a Joseph Boy's relational aesthetics in Castle too, but decades earlier, Boy's explains. Sie befinden sich hier in einem Raum in. Here you are in a space where we apply enlarged art, a space for an important social artwork relating to most societal dilemmas and Antonio Strati comments. That's uh, the point. And uh, this uh, dialogue is uh, continuously there in this epistemology, in this perspective. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's continuously there. So we can specify which sort of dialogue is going on, but not, uh, I cannot see uh, a break between uh, the interpreter and uh, the, the stimulo or uh, artifact. Although we are far away from the documentas and biennales, things Strati and boys speak of may well happen in this tiny little garden, an art space for relational aesthetics, and space is what Tor Hernes sees defining contemporary beauty. And maybe, um, maybe the, the visual part of space is often given to the physical space, but I think there is also a beauty of the social space and also the mental space and the beauty of ideas. Uh. When art interacts with a place, artwork becomes an art space to go beyond institutional formal convention and the material limitation is the competence of the artist, the critic, the technician in an aesthetic play only when art works, when schwung becomes a fact, comes the words, stories. This uh, uh, garden, Le Jardin, belongs to Pierre Guy de Montreux, mm -hmm. but he uh, offers it to artists to realize projects. Uh, there are a number of things that have already happened here. There's a wish, a tree, a wishing tree by uh, Rivan and Orenschwander. You can still see the remnants of this, and it has been very effective because people have put up wishes there and they have actually come true. So it's a very good wish tree.
It's, it's called um, the Wish Tree, and it's mm -hmm. actually it's, um, I've developed a, a project from a previous uh, project that uh, in Brazil you have um, uh, ribbons mm -hmm. made out of fabric, and you put around your wrist like this, mm -hmm. and um, you, you make three knots, and you ask for three wishes. Like I have one here. Okay. And uh, when it breaks out, it means that your wishes will come true. So um, I've collected uh, wishes from uh, friends and different people, and also visitors in the exhibitions. Mm -hmm. So I have here um, 50 different wishes, and they repeat themselves. Okay. So we put on, yeah, I put on the tree, um, sort of for the birds, so they can pick up and uh, build nests. That's uh, like an idea. I don't know if it's gonna happen. Yeah. There's a piece hanging also on the tree by uh, Michelangelo Pistoletto. It's a permanent installation. It's about the, it's a homage to the medieval, um, sorry, to the Mediterranean culture. And and um, then there's the little structure of the house, which is a kind of uh, uh, house for extraterrestrials. This region is well known for its, uh, you know, for connection to outer space, and, and many people believe that they see UFOs. So Spencer Finch built this outhouse for extraterrestrials, and now it's an interactive piece where not only children, right? Now it's children mm -hmm. who are activated, but you can put up images that you think that extraterrestrials should know about our civilization. And the new big project, which is kind of uh, invisible at the moment, but which is very visible at certain moments during the day, is by Korean artist Koo Jong Hak. Uh, she did a similar piece for the Venice Biennale in 2003 in. Uh, um, in the, uh, in the so-called Aperto section, which is more uh, you know, a younger artist. And it's, it, there she used artificial light. It's diamonds, small artificial diamonds in the wall, and they reflect. Uh, but here it's more of a cosmological installation. It really is about the relationship between Earth and Sun. And, and uh, she explains it with just a sentence on the imitation card. It, and it's invisible, but then highly visible. From the tiny garden to the big Biennale, the day before the opening 2003, Venice was long the model for the events that mushroom globally today, in what you call a visual art industry. In the 60s, however, some artists were pioneers going outside their studios, as Barbara Stevina recalls. Slowly art and industry turn to art and business. Artists opened the doors to the workspaces, the factories, and in the 80s they made artwork about corporate strategies. One of these artist groups are Alvar Gullickson and Richard Stanley, Bonk Business Finland. Look at the project which you saw yesterday presentation of with slightly different eyes as an example of, of creative process where the, the coincidence and the, the megalomania and the alcohol have a ma major part. So Bonk Business Inc. Was, came out of this and, and uh, in the spring 89 I had my first one-man show in a gallery in Helsinki, which uh, actually was like a trade fair installation. Where the Although they like to pose as ironical outsiders, they are actually insiders too. Actually, personally, Bonk, I guess, reflects uh, some of my family background, which, which is uh, that of an industrial family, the Austrian family, which uh, it's maybe one of the last family-owned companies in Europe, an old forest company, now maybe even more with high-tech, but a paper company originally. And uh, I'm 
I'm a part of that, the, the sort of the artistic branch of that family. And my grandmother was uh, Maya Gullison, who, who was a uh, quite important art collector and, and uh, supporter of, of uh, design and architecture. And she was a good friend of Alvar Aalto, who also designed the house for, for her and my grandfather. Please, here is uh, one of the cliches that we have been exploring from the business world, symbols of success and power. And that's the head of product development, being young and fresh. But to me, I'm a filmmaker originally, and I don't see any difference between uh, the, the creation of Bonk and, and what I do for companies. I, I'm, I'm writing narratives, um, except I, I try to be much more honest than most people who write narratives for companies. I try. Um, uh, and I try to persuade companies to take different attitudes, but in the end, you're, you're, you're trying to convey the essence of the company or a product to other people. Uh, and the idea of it is actually to persuade people to buy it. And we're doing that with Bonk also, except in the case of Bonk, people really want to buy it. They, many people come and say to us, we wish it were true. Maybe it was more difficult 40 years ago. There is no possibility for industry and art to meet. It's impossible. At Harvard, the matter that matters seems mostly the physical shape of the graduate students. And MBAs still accept habitual dress codes and old forms of education. So still form and matter matters, although old industry is giving way to new business. And no one can really guarantee a brilliant and secure career to students shaped to fit, fit little standard boxes. MBAs may turn to Master of Business Art when private business search for creativity. There's, there's this sort of tension always between what we call stewards and what we call creators. And the stewards are the people who, are, who feel most strongly that it's their job. Um, and this is assuming everybody's well-intentioned. Sometimes there are other characters around too. but. Um, but the stewards are the people who really care uh, about spending the shareholders' money well, for example. They're sort of keenly aware that they're spending other people's money and that they should not invest a dollar that won't return a dollar. The search for artistic creativity makes violin virtuoso Miha Pogacic a sought-after lecturer on corporate leadership here in Dubrovnik Leadership Forum in Croatia. You may sometimes think that this is bad, but it's not bad. This is important at certain given moments, you know. This is important to know this how to handle it. Important. So it's really integration that matters at the end. Paul Robertson and his Medici Quartet teaching teamwork at the Center of Art and Leadership of Copenhagen Business School. jazz improvisation at Harvard Law School to improve methods for training negotiation skills involving the schwung of jazz
formalized principles of improvisation. and notification of the melody, the matter used to improvise jazz. Public avant-garde also strives for a market, Karl Hegemann at Volksbühne says. Kann man sich überhaupt noch aushalten? Und wir sagen, kann man nicht. Jeder muss leben, dass die Kapitalfunktion äh, ist zwingend nötig, damit wir überhaupt... Äh, the capitalistic function makes impossible to remain outside. And therefore, we state that we don't produce for the market, that's no fun, and it's even cynical when all know we have to sell what we do. But we say we produce in the market. We try to sell our stuff to find an audience. My love and devotion has no meaning if no one sees it and buys it. Young artists, they say that uh, we are not free anyway because we have to get grants and money from the government. And that bothers us so much because we apply for some money for one project, then we have changed the project, but we have to do the project we have got the money for. So they have a much more pragmatic uh, view on that. They say that it's no problem for us to get used by uh, business world because if I get the same uh, the same money for one month use, um, working for the business world and that that gives me money to do all the crazy projects the rest of the year I prefer that instead of getting, getting money from the government and then also another thing I discussed with the artists is that uh, some artists are very negative and express uh, the view you have and see it's like the end of the art but other artists say that Art has always, through history, also shown that they can escape, you know, when they get some sort of pressure, they find new ways of escaping, or new forms, or... So, 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 so some artists are not really so, so... This tendency among young artists that Donatella de Pauli has noted, we may call insider art. And Philippe Meres remarks on how some artists still resist this new trend. This is not moral. This money is dirty. And their money, their funding, this, their public funding or art funding or selling to the art market is clean money. Then New Zealand changed the name of its arts ministry to Creative New Zealand. Then you start seeing art, um, Creative South Africa, a Creative America um, document. You start see that, seeing that creativity starts to look like technology and it starts to go into to other worlds and the nature of the arts are being changed as well. So this little, and uh, we've been talking about Trojan horses for a while, it sort of came in and got pushed around. One eminent Australian uh, critic, um, Professor Donald Horn, who was actually head of the Australian ministry in, in the uh, late 80s, has sort of said this was the great Trojan horse because it changed the nature of debate about art and funding, etc., to, to a language of economic rationalisation under the guise of creativity, which had an industrial conflict. And that's why I started to do work on, on well, not only me, but many researchers on the relationship between art and industry. Old industry looking for creativity, old government too. This opens up for art and business flows. Maria Finders of Basel Art Fair on the global art market. We start off with the Moscow Biennale in February. Then it continues on with the Venice Biennale in June. Then Art Basel is stuck in the middle, so we're negotiating about Verdi Sage of the Venice Biennale of Basel. After that is the Documenta Biennale. And then it's the Super Bowl. And then Monster, yeah. and then Istanbul and then Lyon from oh, uh, in the calendar year. Yeah. So when I think about 2007, I realized that the Basel Art Fair, we should maybe just cancel it. <laughs> you know, and that's my, my, my big question about where you can put a trade show in the middle of a year like that. Things is like a flock of collectors. These collectors migrate, 
uh, they start off their year, and you really wonder how they actually work to make enough money to buy art, but they're flocking in all these different things, migrating around, and then artists are also migrating around with them. So the actual amount of work that can be sold, when you consider that in the first two days of the art show this year in June, uh, everything that could be sold was sold, everything. I mean, I'm saying everything that could be sold because something's just kind of sold because you know, they're not interested anymore. You know, they're dealt with their filler pieces or whatever. The show was changed on the Thursday because it runs from uh, the Tuesday, which is kind of pre the preview day for the super important collectors, to the point where uh, a collector like Pino will come actually on the Monday dressed up as a, a worker. Uh, carrying a log and go into the show and try to buy work no. before it yeah, before it actually stopped him three times every three times away. And, and we're gonna actually maybe be very the gallery that always gives him the, the past. You know, like yeah. So th it's a big thing this preview day. Uh, we have two types of VIPs. We have the noon VIPs, which are the ones that can get it at noon, so they can start you know, already buying the work. And then we have the two o'clock VIPs. And the two o'clock VIPs are the ones that get what's left. Mm -hmm. So if you learn about looking, then you learn about aesthetics. If you can't look and see, you don't understand. So if you look and see things you don't understand, you get into this whole intellectual experiment about art. Whereas if you spend five years looking and understanding, the rest is really easy because you can theorize on top of what you see. But if you don't see and you theorize, then you don't know anything if you're talking about aesthetic. You have to see first. Yeah. And then you can theorize. But if you don't see, then it's all there and then you can't do anything. The art market also may be focused on form and matter, but people, the collectors, the investors, the shoppers, also relate through pictures, slides, catalog, price lists, and maybe they transcend the matter of objects and the conventions. In a way, Liam Gillick and Rirkit Tiravania have suggested Daniel Birnbaum comments. And, and so if, if the general commodification of everything and the general commercialization of the entire business that we're talking about produces objects, and he is like a therapist, uh, you know, the way that Wittgenstein's uh, 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 claim that, that philosophy is therapy, it's about uh, loosening up, the, it's like when you when you look at the, uh, the, 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 the illness, the metaphysical illness is that we, we think that objects are everywhere. We insist on on, 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 on on commodities and too. But once we look at the at the language game and how it's really built up, we see that these kind of knots and things disappear, and the objects are uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the metaphysical uh, deboil and realizes the, the kind of problems that where it hurts, they, they remove because we I see really on one level as a therapist of our contemporary art situation. That he insists to do this over and over again, and it's a, 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 a also said that it will never disappear. Language goes on holiday, and the, and, and the problems appear over and over and over again. Art event is no longer only listening and seeing, it implies traveling, walking here as in Münster, or cycling backwards, or doing unusual, strange things to experience an artwork. The body is mobilized to change perspectives beyond cliches and prejudice. This makes art highly relevant for organizational consultants, as Raymond Sarner explains. Mm. In the sense of working as a consultant, I think you have to be able to see more, more or less the phenomena of what is. And you get confirmation by the people if they really are interested. And that's what I think what you're alluding to. If they're interested to get somebody else to help them see what's happening, they will let you know how you should change, how you should add, and then you have an agreement what to do then next, how to shape that into something else, 
in order for it to stick, it has to be a participative. In blind business bureaucracies, it might be good to be able to see again. You may be looking for the light, as Hans Henriksen from Nokia, Denmark. And we have to use the source of renewal that it is that a new guy is coming in here and ask him to say, what are you actually seeing when you come in here? And it does not necessarily...